Welcome to episode 232 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-producer Rod Johnson. He's produced a number of low-budget gay-themed films over the last few years. We talk about his career. Creatively, he got his start by writing a children's book. That eventually led to a writing gig for Disney. And then later he started producing films. He's now produced nearly a dozen feature films. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 231. If you want my free guide, how to sell a screenplay in five weeks. You can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. Just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents and managers and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I'm working on. As mentioned over the last couple of weeks, The Pinch, the crime thriller feature film that I wrote, directed, and produced last year is for a limited time available for sale on the website. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash the pinch. It's all one word, the pinch, all lowercase. I'm going to keep it for sale on the website for the next couple of weeks, and then I will be rolling it out to iTunes and Amazon after that. Also, for just an extra $5, you can bundle the pinch with the three-hour webinar I did on making the film. I go into great Great detail about every aspect of making this film, writing the screenplay, raising the money, and producing the film. So this is a great chance to see the completed film and also see the behind the scenes of how I made it. I will, of course, link to it in the show notes as well. But again, that link is sellingyourscreenplay.com slash the pinch. In terms of my own writing, I've got a draft done of my superhero animated show that I've been writing over the last few weeks. I'm presenting it tomorrow to my writers group, so I'll get some notes on that and then begin rewriting it. The live action kids mystery show I wrote earlier this year for a producer. I ended up writing a show Bible in four episodes. Um, they have brought on a new producer onto the project. He read the first draft of the pilot and um, that, I wrote, that I wrote, and he has some notes. So I might have to go back and do some rewriting on that, which is fine. As I said, um, I've talked about this project a good bit on the podcast, and I've never really done a lot of rewriting. I basically pumped out those first four episodes. Um, and so now it looks like I'm probably going to go back and do a little um, polish up on at least the pilot episode. Interestingly, though, when I talk to this producer last week, um, he, he was actually talking about not necessarily worrying too much about the script and trying to set up some meetings where we pitch it in person. And his logic, it actually seemed very sound to me, is that when you're pitching in person, there's a little bit more flexibility to it. You can adjust the pitch slightly to the specific people that you're pitching to. You can also adjust it sort of on the fly as you see them being interested in certain aspects of the project. You can kind of go in that direction. Whereas if you submit a pilot script it's kind of in stone you know they read that and it's either they like it or they don't like it where it's sort of a, a in-person pitch you can kind of adjust um, so anyways we're going to be talking about that I have a meeting scheduled him with him later today so um, I'm going to talk about all of that and um, hopefully get that project moving forward again anyway so that's what I'm working on writing wise now let's get into the main segment today I'm interviewing writer producer Rod Johnson here is the interview Welcome, Rod, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you. It's, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, I grew up in Southern California. And after spending over a decade working in insurance, I thought I've got to be more creative than this. So I went through a lot of things like uh, photography, acting for five minutes, because it is Southern California, and everybody's an actor for five minutes. And I decided I would try to write something, and I wrote a, a kid's book, a mystery book, 
And um, it actually got picked up by an agent and a publisher and made into a series of kids' books. And because of that, Disney Channel hired me to become a writer for them. And so it started this trajectory of me, even though I said I'd never become a screenwriter, I ended up starting to get into screenplays just because I was so entrenched in like Disney Channel and that world. And so when you started to write this book, um, did you have like an, a, a long-term goal of becoming a children's book author or becoming a screenwriter? What was sort of the goal or was it just purely, I just got to be more creative and this is an, out, an outlet for my creativity? It, pretty much it was that. And <clears throat> because I moved to California when I was five from the Black Hills of South Dakota, my father was from the reservation. And so I became disconnected with that part of my culture. And so when I started writing this book, and the book is uh, Rena Two Feathers Mysteries, and it's pretty much an, a Native American, uh, a Native American girl solving mysteries, um, and I used that to kind of talk to my dad and reconnect with that. And so my goal was just kind of, can I write something? Will it be any good? And can I also understand my Native American culture while doing it? And it turned out to be really good and a lot it got a lot of attention and notice because of the Native American aspect and and a lot of uh, the real side of being Native American at the time yeah and so how how were you able to get it published um, did you know someone in the publishing world did you just start sending out cold submissions I, how did you actually take the book and, and get an agent and get a publisher I actually did send it out and um, you know I think it landed in a lot of slush piles because it was my first time ever I didn't have any experience and I didn't even know at that time it's like you should always say who your audience is and, and what the book is like and um, uh, a friend of mine my husband's friend's husband started a, uh, a small publishing company, and they did crime fiction. And so I was like, well, maybe they'd be interested in it. And I sent it to them, and they actually picked it up, and it was their only kids' crime fiction series that they ever picked up. And they went on to win a lot of awards and stuff with the crime fiction publishing house. And um, so it, it, it kind of was a situation where, sadly, it was somebody I kind of knew but it was also I approached them because they were starting up this boutique publishing company. And, um, you know, I think I've, I've talked to a lot of other novelists and writers and they found a lot of success hitting up the boutique publishers first and, and, and finding that genre. Um, and that's how that's how it started for me. OK. Um, and so literally you wrote this children's book. Had you never really written anything? Um, I mean, obviously school and that kind of stuff. But had you done any just nonfiction or even fiction writing anything at all before doing this children's book? Nothing. Not at all. Okay. Like I said, it was just me trying to explore what am I going to be creative at? What, where are my talents lie? And going through a lot of different things, I said, well, maybe I'll try writing. And, you know, when I was like in second grade, I wrote this short story for class, and the uh, teacher and the principal called my parents in to tell them, you know, for a kid that's in second grade, this is like really good, and we should really nurture that in him to be a writer. This kid should be a writer, and then I never did anything with it because I was a kid, and I just lived life or whatever. So that was kind of in the back of my mind when I thought, well, I'll try writing because acting and photography and all that stuff didn't work out. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the um, the transition for just one second. You mentioned you worked in insurance for 12 years. Yeah. I get a lot of emails from people. Um, they're in some sort of a day job. They're looking to transition out of that day job. Maybe you can talk about how you did that. Did you save up a bunch of money so you had a runway for a couple of years? Did you have some freelance work set up? How did you make that transition from you know published author and, and making money on the Disney gig um, well, from being insurance? Well, you know, while I was insurance, I wrote the first book. Okay. Um, and uh, I actually wrote the second book. I think I was still in insurance. And it, it's so funny. I think we have more – if you're working a full-time day job, then you know that you have to write something when you're not working. So now that I'm not working the full-time day job, it's harder for me to meet those deadlines because that's all I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. And so – that was that was the transition. It was just then I finally decided, okay, I've got two books. I'm going to quit, and what can I do? Well, because I'm an older guy, 
it's when the internet exploded. It became a thing. It was in the early days of the internet. It was the wild, wild west of the, the online world. And a lot of sites were, oh, you, you're a published author? We're going to hire you to write for our site. So when I quit, I found a lot of freelance gigs where I was writing for different uh, websites that are launching. And, and, you know, back then they had so much money when they were launching websites, it was obscene. So they were paying writers to come in that actually had some kind of pedigree to come in and write for them. So I did a lot of online writing. So um, I think uh, when the two books came out and Disney heard about them, they called me in for an interview and then they ended up hiring me to come write with their website, DisneyChannel.com. When they were launching it, it was becoming a bigger portal for, for their entertainment company. Um, and that was uh, very lucky, but uh, it was also a, a really good uh, gig to get when I was first starting. Mm -hmm. So, and this is more of a general question. What do you think it is that just attracts you to the entertainment industry and just, you know, being creative versus why not just hunker down and do that insurance job for 40 years? You know, I, that's a good question. Why is that? You know, growing up in Southern California, being exposed to a lot of seeing what's happening because you're down the street and they're shooting something, a TV show or something, and seeing the process behind people creating something for the entertainment community uh, and that industry, um, it just naturally made me more inquisitive and interested in how that works. Um, and, you know, and I, growing up I was different. Um, you know, I'm a gay man, so growing up, it, back in that time, it wasn't, still wasn't that accepted, and we tend to be drawn towards the more creative fields like theater and high school and things like that just to find the acceptance. And that's where it started planting the seed to be, you know, I can be creative because I like the people in the creative community. There are more people like me in the creative community than in, you know, working for a big corporation kind of thing. And, you know, and, and when I worked in insurance for 12 years, it's very, very... Um, conservative industry. So, you know, I even stuck out a little bit there. So, uh, you know, sometimes that was a, a little difficult, but I think that pushed me to even want to pursue something more creative, even more as an adult. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's dig into your latest film, um, a film that you produce called Happiness Adjacent. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick pitch or log line. What is that film all about? Well, Happiness Adjacent is about a, um, a single gay man getting over a relationship, him and his best friend were going to go on a cruise for him to get over this relationship and have this happy vacation time. Well, his best friend had to uh, cancel the cruise, so he goes on it alone. And he meets um, a, a, a straight man who's there with his wife for their vacation. And because she ends up being sick most of the time, uh, he ends up spending a lot of time with the uh, straight guy and they end up having a connection and kind of then it becomes a physical connection and um, it's about him on this cruise with this guy falling for the wrong guy or what's going to happen with these two knowing that he's uh, having a connection with a married man on a cruise and so okay. perfect um, yeah I think that's a good summation and I just want to stop here a minute and just talk about your relationship with the, the writer director who is also your husband correct that is correct um, yes and so maybe you can talk about that relationship a little bit um, producing a film that your significant other has written and directed there must be some you know minefields that you you sometimes go through creatively or logistically or whatever so maybe we can just talk about that for a minute how you work with your significant other and 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 you know how do you solve problems when you guys have disagreements how do you figure out um, which direction to go well you know I think it's it's all about growing together and we started our company 12 years ago and Rob Williams is the writer director of all nine of our films and I produced them for him. I mean, we first started out in the first three films, especially were very difficult with our relationship. I can remember the uh, first film we did together, the, the, the creative differences we may have had. I mean, at one point it got really bad and I thought, I don't think our relationship is going to survive making this movie because me as a producer, and also a big cinephile and in loving movies. And him, as the writer-director, 
there were times when we both had very different ideas and felt like felt like we had a reason to to push that idea forward me as a producer and him as the writer director you know and even in big hollywood movies you read about the clashes between a producer and a director on a film set and somebody gets replaced usually it's the director well when it's your husband you're not going to replace the director so it i think what happened was three movies in we started to become more older and matured together with what we were doing creatively and understood well here's why rod is offering the suggestion here's why rob is offering the suggestion and we came to understand and know how each other works especially on the film set and we know how to read each other it's like okay i'm going to back away because rob's having this difficulty and i'm not going to be able to offer anything constructive enough and he needs to get through this or he needs my help. I'm going to jump in as producer and say, here's what needs to happen, crew, actors, you know. Um, so I think uh, it, 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 and to this day, it's still, it's still difficult. But you know what, he, we've learned to start listening to each other. And we've learned after nine films, you know, their ideas actually are good ideas. And I actually, I do want to incorporate that idea into what's happening here. And, and, you know, we even start out, I'm, I've developed his scripts that he writes. And, and you know, as a, as a professional reader and developer of scripts that I've done in my past, yeah, I think I, I, I do offer that experience to him. And he, he's gotten to the point where he, you know, he gladly takes it. To the point where even happened as Jason, I was adamant about the ending. He wrote a different ending to that movie, a very different ending to the movie. And I fought and I said, no, it should not, I don't think it should end this way. And he actually ended up changing it. And um, and then he agrees now, and we both agree. It's like okay, that works better. So okay, perfect. Um, so maybe take me through a typical development cycle for um, for a project, and maybe we can use Happy Dis Adjacent as sort of the template. Um, does he typically write up like a first draft, and then you give him notes? Is he writing up scenes? Are you looking at those? And are there other people that are in your sort of orbit? Are there other people that get the script and give notes as well? <laughs> Yeah, there is. You know, when Rob, what, what Rob likes to do is he wants to give me pages. And I've gotten to the point where I, don't, I, I can't read pages. I want to read more at a time when I'm writing down. So why don't you do this? Why don't you send it to me at the act breaks? Uh, you know, a three-act structure screenplay. Send me the first act. So that way I know exactly what you're setting up to happen. I know because, you know, pretty much we're very formulaic writers when it comes to a screenplay. And um, so... He will send me the, you know, the first act, and I'll say, okay, it's, this is great. Here's some things that, you know, some ideas I might have with this character. If you're trying to get this character be to be a specific way, why don't you um, change this scene a little bit, to kind of show a little bit more of the character in it? And we do that all the way to to when the script is completed. Then when the script is completed. Um, there are, you know, we have other friends in the industry, especially the gate indie production industry. It's a kind of a pretty small community, and a lot of them are in Palm Springs and L.A. So, you know, we might get them to read it, offer their notes, and then we'll have, like, we, being in L.A., we have, you know, tons of, most of our friends are actors, professional actors. So we'll have them all over, food, wine, have them read the script out loud so we can hear it see what works, what doesn't, especially the language, and um, get their notes as actors on the script. So that, you know, we, and, and then we'll start moving forward with, you know, the actual pre-production, once we've, like, greenlit that particular script. Once we've had, you know, we, we've never shot a film without having a lot of people look at the script first, because that's such a, you know, that's such that, that's the foundation of your movie is the script. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to spend a lot of time, well, not, you know, in our world, a lot of time with developing it with, once I've done developing it, then calling in, you know, actors and other producers and other directors to take a look at the script and get their thoughts. 
Yeah, yeah. And so how do you know? I mean, I'm in a writer's group and, and no matter how many times, you know, somebody brings something in, like that's our job as writers. We're always going to give notes. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when, I mean, you're, you know what I'm saying? You're always going to get those notes. You're always going to get suggestions. How do you know when it's time? Okay, we're going to green light this project and move forward. Well, you know, I, I think for us, it becomes when it starts becoming so specific with the notes it's like okay you know now we're gilding the lily kind of thing you know let's 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 shoot it and, and, and it, as we're shooting it rob can make little tweaks to the character as he sees fit as he's shooting it but it, it you know what it becomes the point where after two or three or four reads with other people everyone says you know yeah it's good i love the script blah blah, blah and there's less and less like people having problems or having notes with it. And if they do, it's like really, really specific. It's like, you know, does it have to be a car? Why can't you ride a motorcycle? That kind of thing. It's like, okay, I think, I think we're ready now to go to the next phase and see about shooting this damn thing. Okay, perfect. I want to talk briefly just about production and production value. Um, I often get questions from screenwriters asking questions like, you know, how do I know how much something is going to cost in the production. So maybe you can talk about that in general, in sort of a general way. And then specific to happiness adjacent, maybe there are some things that are specific to that project that surprised you, even after nine films, where, where there's some things that you thought were going to be cheap, but were expensive, and some things that you thought were going to be expensive and were cheap. Um, so maybe start just sort of in a general way. You know, how do you know how much something costs and how can you sort of just eyeball your script and get some idea of what the budget's going to be? Well, you know, I think a lot of it for me has been um, as a producer and working on the budget before we shoot something it's just become what I've learned um, over shooting films on our first movie we actually contacted a producer that's produced a lot of films and can eyeball something and say how much something is going to cost I mean there the, there's the the obvious things like you know, a, a, my little indie film that has a fifty thousand dollar budget. I don't think we're going to afford to rent out the Disney Hall for this scene. That might that should be kind of uh, common sense, but maybe not. But it's just for me the experience of finding out what things cost that have become like second nature. Um, and and I think for me it was just it was doing it. It was shooting it and finding out. What it costs, so like, you know, our first movie costs a lot of money to make when it could have probably have been done cheaper, but we just didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, it was like reaching out to experienced people to see if they want to talk with us about producing something. Okay, perfect. And then specific to happiness adjacent, were there some surprises even after nine oh. movies, um, just budget-wise, things that maybe were expensive but you didn't think they were going to be? Well, I, happiness adjacent is going to be a little different to talk about from our other eight films because it was shot on an actual cruise ship over seven days. So it was mm -hmm. very contained. It was, you know, the the director with his three actors and finding places to shoot the particular scene. So everything, it was a bubble as a production goes. It's like all the catering was there, all the crafty was there. He, we shot it on the iPhone success and because we wanted to try something different technology wise. And so it was just, you know, the, the phone and, um, and uh, attachments with the actors and um, so the we kind of knew this film more than any other. We kind of was down to the penny of what we knew what we were going to spend because it was on a cruise ship for seven days, and that's all we shot. Mm -hmm. um, previously, my the, like the film previously, the biggest um, surprises I guess I had was things like budgeting for catering and feeding people it's like you know a lot of people they start with their first film and they get you know their mom or the grandmother or their aunt to cook food every day for everybody well we just try to find local restaurants and maybe do the run at our budget level it's like i'm finding the restaurant every day to provide something and pay for it um or like i did with the last film shared rooms 
I found a local restaurant that we enjoyed, found out they had a catering service, found out that they actually do cater a lot of film shoots, even low budget film shoots, and got pricing like, you know, here's kind of my budget. Can we work within this budget? And he's like, yes, I'll put together, you know, a, a, a menu of what you can afford within this budget every day for 10 days. Mm -hmm. So it's like, then it comes like, oh, well, shoot, we have to add a day or cancel a day and ha and going outside of that, it's like, oh, okay, that's going to cost a lot more because it's not part of the contra contract we have with this particular vendor. And I'm always shocked at how much, when we used to rent a lot of equipment, cameras and things, um, shocked at uh, all the add-ons when you're done with the movie and how much it actually costs to rent the equipment and getting it back or did something mm -hmm. break during the shoot, heaven forbid you break a lens during a shoot because that stuff's expensive. So it's those kind of surprises that I'm seeing now. It's just um, gear. Gear is always you, – you, you could budget for what the gear is going to cost, and then something's going to happen during the shoot. It's like, oh, the HDMI, we blew the light on it. It's like, oh, my God, that's a lot of money. That kind of stuff is always shocking. Okay, perfect. And just to be clear, with Happiness Adjacent, this was shot guerrilla style, which was probably part of your your reasoning for using an iPhone. You didn't yes. go to the captain and no. say, hey, by the way, we're shooting a feature <clears throat> film here. No, you know, we don't didn't. Mind us. You know, it, we didn't because after eight films, especially Rob as the director, and, and you know, he wrote the script, wanted to push himself creatively. He's like, well, we've never done anything like guerrilla style. And what was that? That supposedly guerrilla movie where they shot it in Disney World or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing where nobody knows. And that's mm -hmm. what he, you know, he, Rob goes on a lot of cruises and um, he tends to write on the cruises and he tends to write screenplays on the cruises. So he actually wrote one about being on a cruise, this, this story. Mm -hmm. So he kind of wrote knowing the ship and as he was writing it, he actually even shot B-roll on that particular cruise because it's going to be the same ship that we ended up shooting the actual movie on. Um, so it was, and, and the great thing about technology and everybody having a camera on their phone, everybody's got their iPhone out and they're shooting something on a cruise in vacation. Yeah. So you just kind of blend in. The thing is, what takes the hit is like sound. We don't have a sound guy with the, with the boom mic following around the actors. It's Rob with a sound attachment, with a mic attachment on the phone, trying to not be conspicuous about it. But it's still, you've got a, something attached to your phone that looks different. So it was all about trying to blend in and then and then trying to not like get a lot of people in the shots to where that could be a problem. And, you know, it, it, and we ended up having to go through to get it uh, looked at to make sure it can be cleared for all the legal purposes and insurance and all that to make sure it can be cleared. And, you know, it's all about we didn't linger on this guy in the background for 10 seconds and we can't tell who he is. But which is and, you know, there are times when we had to edit around that. It's like, OK. We can see the small one or two kids really clearly behind these guys. Let's go to coverage real quick and get them out of the shot. So it does, that kind of thing is going to dictate even how you edit a movie when you're shooting out in the wild, especially guerrilla style. Yeah, yeah. So um, you talk about the other, how you've now done eight, you did eight films and this was your ninth film. Maybe you can just talk a little bit and, and the next sort of the next question I'm going to ask is sort of the financing of this film. Um, maybe you can just talk about how you've been able to consist consistently over the last 12 years, consistently been able to produce movies. Um, what's the trick there and, and, and what's your secret? Well, you know, we, we started out probably our first three films, we kind of financed them ourselves. You know, the first film was financed because, you know, unfortunately, Rob lost his dad. And he got a share of the life insurance money. And when he got the life insurance money, he's like, you know what? Why don't we make my script? My, because his first script was developed in a writer's group, the Salon. They're really good. And a lot of really good writers came out of it. And he's like, well, why don't we just use this money and we'll make it ourselves. We have no idea how to make a movie, but we know people who do. So we did that. And so that was all our money. Mm -hmm. And I think the first three films kind of, you make enough on the first one to where it can help finance the next one, you know, if you're lucky. So it kind of rolled into that, but we're still 50% or more of, of, you know, the budgeting is, is, is our own money. And, you know, our, our jobs were pretty good and we had savings and, you know, we're a, 
the typical like you know gay couple with no kids um, with two really good jobs and just we just spent it on our, ourselves and then we turned around and said well let's spend it on making movies and so our budgets uh, are really really low I'm you know I'm I we don't talk a lot about budgeting but you know our films are typically you know less than a hundred thousand dollars and you know and and I've told selling screenplays to Hollywood and I've had meetings with executives that we talk about my production company what we do when i tell them what a, a budget of one of our movies was they fall out of their chair it's like how do you do that and it's like well because we're not hollywood and you guys shoot two pages a day and um, we're shooting 15 a day i mean we're moving fast so um and i feel like i'm rambling i don't know what your original question was but that yeah, well, just the secret, and I think before the interview, yeah, before the interview, you had mentioned too, just being super focused on a specific niche, and I think that's a valuable lesson. Um, it's something that you've mentioned before, so maybe we could t dig into that a little bit. How did you ultimately dive into this niche, sort of gay-themed relationship dramas? Um, how did you you find that niche, and, and how did you ultimately get the market, find the marketing for that niche? Well, you know, there, you know, there are a lot of exceptional uh, LGBT film festivals around the world. And I think arguably the biggest one is Los Angeles, the, uh, the gay festival, film festival here in LA. So we would go to these. And at the time, you know, 12 years ago when we started this, after going for three or four or five years to these films, all of these films about the, you know, the gay man, they were still very much a downer film. I, you know, they were battling AIDS, they were getting bashed, they were dying at the end of the film, and it, they were still very much downers. And Rob and I were like, that isn't representative of what we know in our life with, with the gay community that we belong to. You know, today, gay people, you know, at the time, they're flourishing, they're, they're, they're living with AIDS, they're having productive lives, they're having happy lives. The, you know, marriage isn't legal yet, but uh, but people are partnering up and having families together. So we wanted to make a movie that had a happy, positive ending. And so we knew from the beginning our audience is going to be the LGBT audience. But even more specific that, it's going to be uh, the gay male audience because that's who we are and that's what we're writing from our perspective that we understand and we know. We're just writing something that happens to be very positive, uplifting even. And so our first movie didn't end with a funeral, it ended with a wedding. So we wanted to recreate what the queer cinema was at the time. And since then, we've been recognized for that. We're in books. Rob Williams, a guest host film, has been in books and magazines and being man named Men of the Year for our contribution to queer cinema because we helped usher in, in the 2000s, the new millennium of the new gay queer cinema. And that is, and I've always said what uh, Guest House Films is, we don't make movies about people being gay. We make movies about gay people being. It's not an issue about being gay. We know that. We're moving on from that. But what are the struggles like anybody has? Dating, relationships, finding a job. Uh, uh, enjoying life and overcoming the obstacles from it. So our first film was a gay, a gay romantic comedy that could very easily, all you had to do is replace one of the guys with a girl and it still works as a movie. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be two guys. So that's, that's how we were different. We were one of the first, Rob is the writer director and Guest House Films is the first production company. We're one of the first people to actually portray gay people in a very positive light and that got us noticed and that got us an audience because you know the the gay man in Kansas was still seeing films about people struggling being gay and it's like well you know I've got my partner I want something happy for us to watch guest house films Rob Williams comes along and we're starting to provide that so we created this brand of the movie with a very hopeful happy ending about the, this gay experience, whatever happened in the movie. And, and, and it worked for us because it, there's nothing tinier than the niche than, you know, the, the, the gay man. I mean, and what they- It's a niche within a it's niche. It's a niche yeah. within a niche. It absolutely is. Because it's just, the LGBT market, 
but they include the queer, the, the lesbian films, the trans films, and all these things are more issue related. Our films aren't mm-hmm. issue related as much as they're just entertainment is what we're trying to do. Okay. So now let's talk about the, the film festival route for these films. Yeah. You mentioned the LA festival um, and you were going for a few years. Were you, did you go for a few years before you made some films? So you started to know the program directors and get to know some of the other filmmakers. And then what does that look like in terms of your submission? Then did you get into festivals pretty much from the start? Um, like right out of the gate, you made your first film and were able to get into a decent number of festivals. Our first film, uh, long term relationship, um, a, a romantic comedy, very funny, very body at times, um, and so in the, the wedding. It was the first funny, happy, gay relationship film that these festivals had seen in, in years, if ever. So it got picked up everywhere. That film showed everywhere. It sold out screenings everywhere, and it became a big hit in the festival circuit because it was such a different kind of film at the time. And then for our second film, they found out, oh, that's Rob Williams, that's Guess House Films, we love the first movie, what's the second one? And that was a romantic drama and ended a little bit more ambiguously, but again, it wasn't about how, it wasn't about the struggle of being gay. These guys just mm-hmm. happened to be gay. And again, that second year of the film festivals, or maybe it was, three years after the first film when it hit the festival circuit, it was still a little bit different. And so by that time, by the third film, we started getting film festivals coming to us saying, we will program your film, what is it? So we didn't, to the now, nine, our ninth film, there's a lot of film festivals that we don't have to pay the submission fee and submit the film. They know the brand and they know what we do and they contact us for the most part saying, do you have a new movie this year? Because I'm starting to program the film festival. So yes, we got to know a lot of the film festival programmers. Um, and um, it, it became because of the hard work of, you know, making now nine feature films, we've kind of earned these relationships with film festivals that kind of know us. And again, we're talking a niche. We're talking the gay film festival circuit, the LGBT film festival circuit. You know, now there's this, we're coming kind of full circle now, especially with the current administration and, and what that means to the LGBT audience, that now a lot of issue films are starting to come out, especially from filmmakers of color, um, lesbian filmmakers. A lot of people that aren't hadn't been historically recognized in the past are starting to move up and get more attention because that's, that's kind of the new wave of what's happening socially with what's happening in the, in the LGBT community. Um, so we kind of, you know, I, I say we're kind of lucky in what we get with the film festival community, but I also know that we worked after 12 years to get to the point where we're lucky enough that they will ask us for the film. And so what does the distribution look like? Do you do, like with um, Happiness Adjacent, have you done like a film festival run for six or nine months and then you put it out to the public? Um, maybe just talk about that a little bit because I'm curious. I have my own film, which you can see the poster for behind yeah. And I'm, you know, ent- I'm entered, I'm getting more, more rejections than acceptances to film festivals. But I'm just curious, like what is sort of the standard procedure now? Um, have you done a film festival run with Happiness Adjacent and now you're getting ready to actually put it out into the world? Right, yeah. Well, our our um, kind of uh, what's the way to use it? Kind of our business model for each film that we've done. We'll make the film. We try to make it the right time of year because the um, the LGBT film festival circuit. It's big in the spring and then it's big in the fall. There's mm-hmm. some in the summer, especially because Pride is June and and I think Outfest in LA. I think that's a July film festival. But um, so we learned when everybody has their festivals and when it works. So if we shoot the film at the right time and get it through post at the right time, we typically have spent probably uh, almost a year hitting that film festival circuit uh, through the United States and, you know, a lot of times around the world getting picked up for the film, for their film festival. So we typically, as a business model, shoot the film, get it done, get it completed. A lot of times we've 
premiered the film at a bigger gay film festival like Chicago or New York on a rough cut of the film. And they'll take the rough cut of a Rob Williams film so they can get the premiere of the Rob Williams film, the Guest House nice. Films film. And so we'll typically spend a year doing that and then know that we'll either... Guest House Films also became a distribution company. Mainly we did that financially because we found out that a lot of the the um, big gay distributors took a huge cut of our film and we be, we got the relationships with the retailers, film festivals, we could do it ourselves and cut out the middleman. We just have to create the DVDs, manufacture them ourselves and, and work as a you know distributor. And, and um, so it depends on if we if we license the film out to a different another distribution company or we di- distribute it ourselves. We'll, so if we distribute the film ourselves, we can choose the date that will come out on DVD and streaming and all that. And that's typically a year after we've done the festival run, just so we get the laurels for the packaging. We can get the quotes from the press to put on the packaging and the DVD, and get get it known out there in the in the LGBT film viewing audience. Um, with the new film, we rushed, we did it really fast. We shot the film. We've only played a couple of film festivals. We're, we're uh, premiering it on the West Coast on May 29th, the day of the DVD release here in Palm Springs, with Palm Springs Cultural Center. They're going to do a screening. But we didn't play the film festivals because we didn't shoot it at the right time to get it done in time to start the film festival run because there's a season to cruises and you know you have to choose the cruise that we can shoot the film on and it wasn't typically spring like we might shoot a movie so we can get it ready it was later in the year so we just did a really truncated shorter uh, uh, film festival run and that was like Tampa, Chicago, a couple of other cities and then we just were putting it on DVD really quick on this new okay, one. Perfect. Yeah. And so when you say you're set up, um, Guest House Films is set up as a distributor, are you getting inquiries from other filmmakers yeah. to distribute their stuff? And that's going to be a part of your business model going forward too? Yeah. And we've done. In the past couple of years, we have uh, distributed other people's uh, films, movies. Um, we did a, okay. a great uh, documentary out of Australia, The Doctor's Wife, that, that was a, a really good film. And we did, for a while, none of the retailers were picking up short films from the festivals. So Rob and I went to all the festivals, found short films, and we started doing collections of short films for the gay audience. And we did, uh, I think, four of those, the Briefs Mm -hmm. series. So we did Black Briefs, which is the darker horror kind of dark films. And we did Blue Briefs, and that was the romantic short films. Um, And so we did this series of Briefs, and, you know, and then you can put, you know, a guy in underwear on the cover and sell a lot just from the cover. Uh, that's our audience. But uh, yeah. so, you know, so we have we do also distribute. And now, you know, and we have to go up against the big guys, the big gay distributors. And, that you know, for a while they were offering a lot of money up front that we couldn't offer, you know. So we'll give you a $30,000 minimum guarantee. It's like, well, we, we can't do that. But you know what? They're taking 70 percent of your movie. You know, we'll give you sixty percent. We'll only take forty, but we're not going to give you that kind of money up front. And so you you get a lot of the first time filmmakers that oh no, I want the thirty thousand dollars up front. And I'm like, okay, that that's great. You're just never going to see another dime because that distributors they're. Hard to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's not a gay themed issue. Yeah, that's yeah, across right, the board with right. all distributors. Yes. yes. So, um, so what does that mean, though, in terms of you guys are set up as a as a um, as a distributor? Do you have relationships with buyers? Do you get a booth at AFM? What does that actually we, look like? We've never gotten the booth at AFM. We've gotten such. Uh, there are like three major distributors of LGBT titles out there, and we know them. And they, if they've not carried our films, they know who we are. So when when um, and I said those were retailers. So when we decided to not go with the distributor because, frankly, it's just they made all the money and we didn't. Um, we knew we could go to TLA, who distributes, Wolf, who distributes, um, Breaking Glass, who distributes, um, and have not distribute but uh, retails these videos. They're the biggest retailers out there. 
we went directly to them. It's like, you know, we're distributing now. It's like, great, we'll do business with you. So we were able to just like put them in places now and, and Amazon. And, you know, at the time, Netflix was picking up gay films. Netflix has stopped doing that. So it's really been a blow to the LGBT indie filmmaking community that Netflix isn't picking up these titles anymore. Unless you have, you know, Jennifer Garner as the mom. You know, those bigger Hollywood gay themed movies, they'll pick up. But for us, little guys, we're, we don't have Jennifer Garner in our movie. Um, mm-hmm. So we, the, we, we had those relationships with the retailers that, that we were able to use. And that's how we became a distributor for, for other films and our own. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So um, what is next for you guys? Is there a 10th film in the pipeline? You know, there is. It's um, right now we're, as I'm talking to you, we're waiting for UPS to drop off, you know, a thousand DVDs of a new movie because we're distributing ourselves. So we're working on up until May 29th trying to get uh, a lot of marketing done with the new film. The 10th film, I'm really pushing to kind of create a little shingle beneath guest house films to do a horror movie because a horror movie isn't typically the guest house films brand because it's not a happy uplifting movie. But if we did like guest house films after dark or something and created a different shingle, I really want to do a, you know, a really low budget horror movie because then it kind of breaks out of the LGBT market. A horror of fans will watch pretty much any kind of horror and if you just happen to have, like, you know, the lead happens to be, you know, a gay guy, but it's not overtly in your face. I'm struggling with being gay, but here's the scary mm-hmm. things that's happening to me because I happen to be gay. It, it opened, it's kind of a bigger market for us, and we would like to do that. And I'm a huge horror fan, so I would love to make a horror movie. And so we're trying to develop something that we could shoot here in Palm Springs uh, okay. that's a horror movie. Yeah, perfect. And I had, and I can't remember the name of the film title, um, but it was it was a a director and a producer, and they were with Breaking Glass, and it was a gay themed thriller. And um, you know, again, it was sort of a niche within a niche. And I'm curious um, if that's is that sort of the direction you're going with your horror? It would be sort of a gay themed horror script, so you would try and be. I guess that would even be a niche within a niche within a niche. Yeah, yeah. You know, if we because we still want to produce something with our backgrounds in mind being, you know, gay men, yes, it would. Um, it, you know, it, me as a writer, even stuff that I try to sell to Hollywood, I'll sneak in a, a you know, a really fun little gay character in there. And, you know, there, a lot of big Hollywood movie has their gay best friend or somebody that's funny and gay or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's even with my horror film, it's not the one, actually the one I'm writing now that I want to try it. It's kind of a one location, scary if you've seen the horror movie Hush with the deaf girl in the house. That, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, her best friend is a, is, is a gay guy and has a relationship, but she's not. So it can still work with what Guest House Films does. It's just not, in my particular horror movie, the main character is not gay, but there's still a big gay presence with her best friend who has a lot to do in the movie. So, you, working that way, I think. But yes, they're you know they're they're you know that uh, a friend of mine wrote like the first gay sci-fi movie. That's what Wikipedia is calling it. It was called the Socket. You know, and so the, and, and somebody did the first gay slasher movie, and I'm trying to remember the name of that, and that came out about seven years ago and it took place in west hollywood um and the gay thriller I, i'm trying to remember what that one that you were talking about which one that was so you know the gay the, we're, we're trying to hit all the genres <laughs> making mm-hmm. putting yeah. gay in front of the genre um and that's happening a lot so i don't think there are any genres left that we haven't put the gay in front of yeah yeah Sure. So um, how can people see um, Happiness Adjacent? Um, do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? iTunes, Amazon, whatever? Um, yes, whatever yeah, May, and May 29th, it's pretty much a day and date kind of thing. It'll be uh, available on DVD and on Amazon. Um, you know, there's guesthousefilms.com. It's our website that people can go and look and find out. Um, Guesthouse Films uh, on uh, Facebook slash Guesthouse Films. So the, all of that. But yes, I think... We pretty much worked it to where on May 29th, the DVD is shipping out and available, and we're hitting uh, 
Oh, I'm trying to think of the streaming sites. It's hard to find a lot of streaming sites, but we're getting on uh, Vimeo. We're hitting Vimeo. So I, it may try and have everything. It's, every, it, it's on all the typical places except Netflix, sadly. <laughs> Perfect. And I will get um, I will get your website. I will put that in the show notes, the Guest House Films, and I'll I'm sure you have a Twitter account and that kind of stuff. I'll I'll round that stuff up. Do you have anything personally that you use Twitter, Facebook that you're comfortable sharing? I always just like to um, round out the the interview by asking you um, how people can keep up with what you're doing. I'm sure there'll be some people interested in just following along with your journey. Yeah, there's you know Guest House Films on Instagram. That's easy to find. Just search for Guest House Films, and then um, pretty much we use Instagram a lot and um, Facebook a lot. Rob's got his personal Twitter, Rob Williams. Uh, I think it's called the the real Rob Williams on Twitter. Um, and because people tend to think he's Robbie Williams, the musician from England, um, to the point that they will call and say, is this Robbie Williams? Like, um, no. But, uh, <laughs> um, and Facebook is okay. pretty much the best place that you'll find us. And, you know, the website. Guess I'll- yep, yep. Perfect. So I'll round all that up. I'll put that in the show well, thank notes. You. Rod, I really appreciate you coming on talking with me. Um, good luck with this film thank and um, all your future films. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I had a blast. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, If your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation, of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer, director, Asif Akbar. He wrote and directed and produced as well a cool sci-fi thriller film called Astro. We talked through his career and how he has managed to get to the point where he's writing and directing feature films. We really dig into this current film, but also some of his past films, and he's very open about how all of this came together. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on something from today's interview with Rob. A lot of great information in the interview, um, but I want to touch on one thing that he's doing, which I think is super smart, but not altogether intuitive. The way he has niched down to not only gay themed films, but a niche within that niche is a great way to build an audience. When people are starting out, there's this tendency to try and write something that will appeal to almost everyone. And this seems logical, right? I mean, the more potential people who are in your audience, the more chance you have of finding that audience. Sounds reasonable. But that's actually not right. First, when you try and appeal to everyone, there's a good chance you won't end up appealing to anyone. It's just sort of the jack of all trades, master of none. 
Secondly, when you're doing, when you're going for these four quadrant films, and basically that's meaning if you don't understand the term four quadrants, it basically means going for everyone. You're talking about young males, young females, older males, older females. So it's basically the four quadrants, which encompasses everybody on the planet. You are competing directly. When you're going for those types of films, you are competing directly with the studios. The studios are making these hundred million, two hundred million dollar films, and those by nature, they have to be four quadrant films because they're spending so much money on them, they have to appeal to virtually everyone to stand any chance of recouping the money. But that's a big problem if you are an independent producer or an independent screenwriter writing scripts for this market because you don't have the resources that they have. Unless you have $100 million to produce and market your film, you're never going to be able to compete with the studios. And even if you did have that money, and this is really an important thing to consider, even if you had the money to spend, $100 million, $200 million to spend, it would still be an incredibly different thing to do. And, and when I mean say to do, compete directly with the studios because these studios have years and years of experience doing this. They have a whole apparatus that is geared towards producing these films and ultimately selling them. They have the manpower in place to produce this type of, you know, very expensive high-end content. And they have the relationships in place to sell this type of content. So it's going to be a tall order to produce a successful independent film at the studio level. Of course, it has been done. There are some, some shining examples where people have been able to do this, but it's a very, very difficult, risky proposition. So those are the disadvantages for low-budget films trying to garner too wide an audience. So what are some of the advantages? First, and these are sort of really the key important points, it's easier to find your audience when you niche way down. If you have a film for a very specific audience, there will be specific podcasts, specific blogs that are on that topic. And those outlets are usually pretty open to showcasing films like that. So if you are the producer or the writer of those films, it'll be easier to find that audience. It's going to be a smaller audience, but those people hopefully will have come together in some way. Again, whether it be a blog, a podcast, maybe some sort of Facebook, page, there'll be something where those people congregate and it will be fairly easy to get to those people and tell them about your film. Secondly, and this is the most important part of all of this, as a writer who is, is on the rise, as a filmmaker who's on the rise, as a producer who's on the rise, it's much better to have a thousand true fans who absolutely love your work than a hundred thousand lukewarm fans who think your work is you know pretty good because those true fans will support you and buy your content and there's a much higher chance that they will tell their friends about your content. The lukewarm fans, yeah, probably not. They're probably not going to buy a ton of your stuff. They're probably also not going to tell their friends about it. And it's much easier to gain these true fans by giving them something that the studios, the bigger companies, simply aren't giving them. Also, and this is important to keep in mind, a lot of people, when they niche down, they think that they're pigeonholing themselves. Oh, it's too niche. It's too small an audience. But that's usually not the case. It's easy to branch out as you build an audience, but it's virtually impossible to niche down once you've sort of started a project. And the key, no matter what, is to gain those passionate fans. So really think about what I'm saying here. You know, if you're a screenwriter, but not a producer, if you're a screenwriter, you're trying to gain the, the, those passionate fans are going to come in the form of producers that are passionate for your work, willing to read your stuff, willing to help you develop your stuff, willing to take your stuff to their contacts and potentially sell it. If you're a producer, obviously, you're trying to find people to actually buy the content. And again, it just makes it super difficult if your audience is too broad. It just becomes very difficult to figure out who that audience is, and it becomes difficult to actually reach that audience. Let's talk about a couple of very specific examples. Take this podcast, for instance. Screenwriting is a niche, but it's a pretty broad niche. I mean, it's probably you know half the people or a quarter of the people on this planet, 10% of the people, huge, huge volume of people want to be screenwriters, think they could write a, script, a good script. Um, so it's a huge, huge audience just screenwriting. It's a niche, but it's a pretty big niche. When I was starting out, I felt like there was a million. When I was starting out with this podcast, I felt like there was a million and one blogs, podcasts, books, videos, et cetera, et cetera, on the craft of screenwriting. 
So I wanted to go in a different direction. I've sold a bunch of scripts all without an agent. So I feel like I'm in a pretty good position to talk about selling your screenplay. And again, I felt like this was a niche that was not being covered enough. Too much, I, there's too much, I, I always felt like there was too much sort of general advice thrown out there that basically boiled down to just write a great script and the rest will take care of itself. I always felt like that advice was just really lacking something. So I felt like there was a potential need as a screenwriter, I always felt that that, that was lacking. So I felt like there was a need for this niche within a niche. So that's kind of how I decided on selling your screenplay.com. Again, I think it separated myself out. I went a niche within a niche, and I'm only and and I think it has bared fruit. I mean, most of the people who bump into my podcast, who contact me, they're not the complete novices on the beginning of the journey, just trying to figure out how do I write a script. There's someone that's at, at the very least come up with an idea, maybe written a treatment, maybe written a paragraph. But most of the people who listen to this are people that have have actually written scripts and that's again that's because of the niche that I have 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 chosen now as the podcast has evolved I feel like it's become more filmmaker centric I've gotten more into producing than when I was five years ago when I started the podcast you know producing the pinch has been a um, big part of the podcast and a big part of my own life and I think I'll do more of that I enjoy the process and I do I want to get more into that so I've been thinking about maybe trying to create or 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 turn the podcast, make it more filmmaker centric and broadening my niche a little bit and maybe start a new podcast geared more towards filmmaking in general. And here's the thing. If I were to do that, a good percentage of my audience would follow me to that new podcast. But most of the people who listen to this podcast, they probably would never have actually started out by listening to just a sort of generic filmmaking podcast because those people are screenwriters. So if I do decide to do this and go and create a new podcast, a second podcast, a filmmaking central podcast, I already have at least some audience ready to go. And then I'll hopefully also expand my audience as I pick up directors and producers and perhaps actors who might have who might never have listened to a screenwriting podcast. So again, it's just, it's a sort of game of inches. And I think if I were to launch this filmmaking, this filmmaker podcast, I would already have a leg up over maybe someone who's just starting out because I've got some, at least a small audience from selling a screenplay. And at least some of those people would follow me over to this new podcast. So again, I'm just trying to illustrate sort of how you can broaden your niche and expand. Even though I niched way down, I can slowly start to build from that. And, and again, I'm doing something I, I was able to do something and build an audience because I don't think there was a ton of competition out there. There's not a ton of resources out there specifically geared toward how to sell your screenplay. There's a lot of stuff about writing, but not so much selling. So I was able to build a small audience, and now with that audience, maybe I can take it somewhere else. And again, just relating to your own screenwriting endeavors, I think that's an important thing. If you can write something that's very focused, very niche, and you gain the attention of a couple of producers, then when you go and write your script that's maybe a little bit different from that original one, if they like that original one, they will probably go with you for the ride. They will probably read some of your other material that's not necessarily in that super niche down. Um, genre. Let's talk about the pinch for a second because I think this, I think the pinch really illustrates what um, what I'm talking about. So who's my audience for the pinch? Um, it's a sort of crime thriller like Reservoir Dogs or Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. So, you know, I could say that's my audience. You know, the people that like those movies, that's my audience. So how do I connect with those type of people? Honestly, I'm not sure, but even if I could figure something out, it's probably not going to be that easy. I mean, perhaps there's a few blogs out there dedicated specifically to Reservoir Dogs, um, but, you know, my guess is those blogs are more like fan blogs for Quentin Tarantino, fan sites for him, than and and the audience loves Quentin Tarantino. That audience may or may not be looking to buy knockoffs of Reservoir Dogs. So again, I'm not quite sure how I could connect with that same audience. There is an audience there, but I don't necessarily know how to connect to it. I mean, these movies were successful. Reservoir Dogs, Lock, Sock, and Two Smoking Barrels. They were successful movies. So we know the audience is there, but how do you connect with those people? I honestly don't know. And that's a problem, I would say, that I'm facing with the pinch. So... I'm not sure. Bottom line is I think I have created a film with too broad an audience. So what I'm doing is making it about the writing and producing of the film. That's why I did that three-hour webinar where I break down the entire process of making the pinch. 
And then as a marketing plan, I'm going to go out and hit up all the other filmmaking podcasts and try and promote it to their audience as a sort of case study. And I've gotten to know some of the other, at running my own podcast, I've gotten to know some of the other filmmaking podcasters. So, you know, I have a relationship with them, some of them, not all of them, but some of them will probably be willing to have me on. And that's going to be kind of the start of my marketing plan. Again, this is a niche that I was interested in in doing, uh, interested in pursuing because of my own audience, my own sort of base. Um, so really, kind of keep that in mind. Um, of course, the real hope. Um, the real hope is that the people listening to these filmmaking podcasts. Um, most most filmmakers, I want to take a step back, most filmmakers, they love Quentin Tarantino, myself included. And so I think that's one potential way of finding that audience. And then added to, I mean, and those those people, the the filmmakers that are fans of Quentin Tarantino, which is a lot of sort of the, the, the filmmakers out there, they might be interested in seeing a micro-budget knockoff version of Reservoir Dogs just for their own curiosity because they probably have their own version of that film. So they might be interested in seeing what I was able to do on a micro budget and they might be able to use that information. Same thing with my um, making of webinar. Um, they might be very, very interested in that. And the other thing about the making of webinar, you know, it took me a while to prepare it, but you know, let's say maybe I spent 10 or 20 hours like outlining it. And then I spent the three hours actually producing it, maybe a little more than that because the webinar is three hours. So maybe that was an hour production. It's pretty easy to produce webinars, but let's say well less than 40 hours. I was able to produce a piece of content to sell along with my film. And again, that's all in just sort of your e-commerce 101 is getting your shopping cart up a little bit. So I've got sort of a value add. I feel like it's a very valuable webinar. I feel like the people I'm pitching the film to, you know, you're, you who's listening to this podcast now might be interested in that. Um, and same thing, when I go on these other filmmaking podcasts, not only do I have the film to sell, but I also have this webinar to go along with the film. So it's just kind of, again, just just a little bit of an upsell or add-on to the shopping cart, um, which will hopefully, again, increase increase the dollars that come through. So that's my strategy. And then, again, ultimately what you're hoping for is, is that this will be enough to kind of get the wheels turning, and hopefully they'll tell some of their friends. And then hopefully it will spill over and appeal to more than just, you know, the filmmaker crowd. Um, but, um, but if it doesn't, that's fine too, and hopefully I can come close to recouping my money with just that crowd. So I do think I made a mistake with the pinch. I do think that I should have thought maybe a little bit more about how I was going to, I was going to market the film. I guess, and let me take a step back. I guess really in the back of my mind, I always kind of knew that I would be able to do it as kind of a case study to filmmakers because I knew that I was kind of piped into this filmmaking world. Um, so maybe I kind of did know that pretty early on in the process, but I think I could have probably spent a little more time thinking that through and coming up with something that, you know, just maybe had a little more oomph as opposed to just being two filmmakers. Okay, so let's take a step back. Um, Again, most people listening to this podcast, they're screenwriters, not producers. So how does this affect all of us? I think I've touched on that a little bit, but let's just wrap it up here. Again, when you're going for those four quadrant, big, expensive tentpole films, there is a million people writing those films. You're competing at the highest level with the best writers, the most experienced writers in the world. So it's going to be very difficult to get some traction and to stand out in that kind of a world. It's fairly easy to branch out with your writing once you've started to meet producers who like your work, just as I mentioned. So again, if you can somehow figure out how to niche down a little bit and then find the producers who may be in that niche, um, it's a great way to build some relationships. And a producer who is interested in some very specific niche, it might be unrelated to filmmaker filmmaking. Like you might send send a um, a queer a cold query letter to a producer and pitching just with your log on and that producer might be interested in the subject that your very very niche story is about and that might be enough for him to request the script so again you're trying to get your hooks in it. if you're just pitching another very generic action film a generic you know comedy broad comedy it's going to be tough to make that script stand out um, and it's going to be tough you know maybe your your pitch is excellent maybe the producer will take it and read it but there's nothing super intrinsic intrinsically interesting about that story to this producer again if you niche way down on your story come up with something very very specific um, maybe that producer will have a connection with that specific thing I remember when I first got to Hollywood 
Um, I just started, you know, typical story. I roll into Hollywood, didn't know anybody. And I just started back then in the, um, in the mid to late nineties. Um, it was really before email was, was ubiquitous and you would just send out faxes. You would find, um, you would find a, a one ad, maybe the Hollywood reporter or something. And there would be like a fax your resume to this thing. And I would fax in my resume and I, you know, it just, it was a numbers game, you know, faxing in, faxing in. And, um, you know, sometimes you'd get called in for interviews. Most of the time you would never hear anything back. One of the times I I actually got a job and um and and I asked well how did you how did you pick me and in that particular instance it was just purely random like they just they literally had gotten like a it was a really it was a low level PA job it paid fifty dollars a day so back then I don't even I don't even think it was minimum wage even back then in the late nineties um, mid to late nineties I don't think it was minimum wage so it wasn't even a minimum wage job and they got like it was literally one hundred twenty resumes and mine was just the one they pulled off the stack now there was another one that I applied for it was the same sort of a job PA at a production company and. Um, and there, the guy had gone, or or his brother or something, had gone to the same college I went to. And my college, it was a college called Guilford College in Central North Carolina, very small liberal arts college. But his brother or sister or something, there was some relation to that. And he just saw it on my resume and said, eh, you know, I've heard of this college. It's it's a kind of a cool place. Um, you know, I'll bring this guy in. So again, having those sort of just very personalized hooks are, are what's going to give your story some intrinsic value. And again, if that producer, if your script is a story about something very, very specific that that producer is also interested in, you know, they're going to take a chance and they're going to read that script. Hopefully it's well-written and good, but, um, but there, it's going to stand out above the, the just mountains of other similar, you know, stories that we've all heard a million times. And so let's just go one step further. There's a million ways to do this. Obviously, if you're not gay, then gay themed films probably are not going to work for you. And that's not in any way the implication that it has to be, um, you know, along those same lines. There's a million, you know, things, there's a million ways you could do this yourself. And one clear example is, you know, hobbies. People are passionate about their hobbies. So if you could write a story that revolves around some very niche hobby that you are also involved in, so you know so you're sort of on the inside of this world, those people that are in that hobby, they are probably pretty, they would probably be pretty excited about a film about their particular hobby. Again, just as a screenwriter, this can work as well because again, the producer might also be in the hobby. You may not be able to figure out who the producers are that are interested in that hobby, but if you start sending out a lot of cold query letters, if you start networking, you might be able to find that hit. You might be able to find that one producer who's also interested in this same thing. And let's use a specific example. You know, if you you know, race motorcycles on the weekend, maybe you could write a story, a script about that particular niche, some sort of, you know, intimate story about people who race motorcycles on the weekend. There's probably a whole subculture about this. Oftentimes I will see people on the weekends, you know, they'll have their, their pickup trucks with the trailer and they have their old racing motorcycles on there. Like I see these people, there's, I know nothing about it. I know nothing about the sport or the hobby or, or, or anything. Um, but I see it a lot, you know, I see it a lot on Sundays. Saturdays, I see people going out into the desert. Maybe it's an LA thing. I don't know. Maybe where you live in the country, you don't see this this much. But I often see it, and I wonder. Gee, I wonder what that's all about. There's again, I'm sure there's a whole subculture to it. There's probably a whole language. There's probably just a whole interesting world there um, that that could be explored. And if you're in that world and you already know about that stuff, you write a story that's about that. Number one, if you are a producer, you can probably go to those people and maybe do a Kickstarter campaign, maybe get them. You can find the people who are sort of the leaders in that niche and network with them. Probably fairly easy. Get them to promote the film. Get them to promote your Kickstarter campaign. Those types of things. And then on the flip side of that, if you're just a screenwriter, maybe when you're sending out cold query letters, maybe if you win a contest, that producer will be reading the log lines for the winning contest and he will see that it's about um, motocross and then he will be like oh I'm into that or my brother was into that oh it's always so interesting I remember as a teenager I was into it or something and they'll just be that little hook that you can get um, and again that's the fa that's sort of the power of the niching down it's um it seems counterintuitive at times because there's a smaller audience for your material, but the audience you find will be more passionate for your material. Anyway, that's enough of me rambling. That is the show. Thank you for listening.